Good morning, and welcome to our survey of new and emerging optical playback methods for mechanical audio carriers. I'm David Givanoni, and in the next 90 minutes, we'll learn about five different technologies that optically retrieve audio recordings that were born mechanical. Each of our distinguished panelists is doing pioneering work in this field. Now, as for myself, I'm just an, an eager consumer, as are many of you. Optical retrieval is an essential tool in our preservation arsenal. We know that when done right, traditional stylus or tactile transfers deliver much higher audio quality. But we all have carriers in our collections that are not candidates for tactile or stylus transfer and retrieving some sound from them is better than letting them lie mute. Delaminating lacquers are a significant concern, as are broken and deformed cylinders, discs, and belts. And don't forget audio recordings that were not even intended to be played. Remember phonograms? Thank you. <laughs> they have a trace, but no groove. So optically based playback is the only way we can hear these carriers and orally preserve their content. Now we're incredibly fortunate to have optical installations such as Irene at our disposal today. But it's useful to remember, optical systems are still in the early days of development. They are not mature. Irene and similar systems have emerged from laboratories as intimidating benches of high-tech components that need highly trained technicians to operate. But imagine an optical system built in the footprint of a regular turntable. Or imagine walking into an archive with a small scanner or a camera and taking home playable images of grooved media. Imagine playing optically in real time. The systems our panelists are developing deliver all of these features and more. And that's important because audio retrieved optically will remain sonically inferior to audio retrieved tactically, tactically for the foreseeable future. And for this reason, optical solutions must offer compensating and compelling features that make them worth developing, worth investing in, and worth ultimately worth using. I've asked our panelists to answer questions that consumers like us will ask. Sure, we'd like a general sense of the technologies, but leave most of that for AES, thank you. Most importantly, what is the real-world audio quality of the panelist system? What is the real-world throughput? Are there media for which the system is particularly well-suited or not? Are there applications in which the system is for which the system is specialized. Might this technology be made available to archivists everywhere? And if so, when? And what might the costs be of acquisition and ownership and operation? We begin with Patrick Fieser. He, has re he received his doctorate in folklore and ethnomusicology in 2007 from Indiana University in Bloomington, where he's now media preservation specialist for the Media Digitization and Preservation Initiative. He's a three-time Grammy nominee, co-founder of the First Sounds Initiative, past president of ARSC, and he's been actively involved in locating, making audible, and contextualizing many of the world's oldest sound recordings. Patrick? Thanks, David. The tools I'm going to be describing today were originally designed to play phonograms, recorded by Édouard Léon Scott de Martinville in the 1850s and 1860s. The world's oldest records of airborne sound vibrations originally made to be seen rather than heard. And because they were made to be seen rather than heard, these traces sometimes look and behave like respectable record grooves, but sometimes they don't, as you can see in the example shown here. 
Ten years ago, I was looking for some way to convert traces like these into playable audio that would do a good job with the good parts while also getting something meaningful out of the messed up parts. I ran across Andrew Jaremko's freeware program, Image to Sound, which is designed to convert images into audio as though they were optical film soundtracks, uh, translating the brightness of successive pixel columns into successive audio samples. Uh, for a while, I was using this to play phonograms by first using Photoshop to turn their wavy lines into bright bands of varying width. Uh, but this approach was far from ideal. On one hand, preparing the images was really labor intensive. Among other things, I had to go through and join any breaks in the trace by hand, which could take hours. On the other hand, the software itself had some frustrating quirks and limitations and hasn't been kept up. Uh, nowadays, you have to run it in compatibility mode for Windows 98. <laughs> so, a few years ago, I turned to MATLAB and its free alternative Octave uh, computing environments with scripting languages that can be used to read in images, process the data however you like, and then write it out again as audio. I found that it took just five lines of code to accomplish the same thing I'd been using image to sound to do. Uh, moreover, with 11 lines of code, I found a way of converting wavy lines themselves into audio, saving myself from having to do most of that time-consuming manual processing. My new strategy centers on calculating the average position of the brightness in each pixel column. It works pretty well. In fact, I find the results are significantly more accurate than what I'd been able to achieve with image to sound, as well as requiring a lot less work. Uh, before, you know, it you would know, take a good day to get through a phonogram. Now I can easily get through several in a day. Uh, lately, I've been using this method to play a lot of Scott phonograms I'd considered too cumbersome to play using the older method. Here's an audio example you won't have heard before, dating probably from December of 1857. It's one of the records Scott made of notes played on a cornet. Uh, be forewarned, Scott rotated the cylinder of his phonograph by hand, resulting in extreme fluctuations in recording speed. <laughs> That's all of it. The, uh, the name I've given my software is Picture Chymophone, uh, Picky for short. <laughs> uh, chymophone literally means wave sounder. Uh, the image to audio conversion itself just takes a few lines of code, but I've also built in optional provisions for batch processing, multiple strips into single audio files with consistent amplitude and smooth transitions between them, uh, taming DC offset, uh, translating displacement and velocity, things like that. Uh, one version of this uh, is available right now for anyone to use. In November of 2016, I released Picture Chymophone 1.0 on my blog as an Octave script. Both it and the Octave framework needed to run it are freeware. It's admittedly a bit clunky. You need to specify what you want to do with a sequence of unwieldy command line arguments as shown here above in blue but it works. There's also a picture Chymophone 2.0 written for MATLAB, which I haven't yet released, but which offers all the same features through a more convenient graphical user interface. It also has some auxiliary features, such as an editing screen that overlays the auto-detected waveform on the original image and lets you tweak it in various ways. Uh, for example, by interpolating over a glitch, drawing a new curve by hand, or smoothing out a bumpy section. There's also a separate tool for correcting fluctuations in recording speed, either by using the tuning fork pilot tone found on phonograms from 1860, or by analyzing cyclical patterns in an effort to improve the speed stability of phonograms without tuning fork traces, such as the cornet record I played for you a moment ago. 
Going into all the details of this would really require a separate presentation of its own, but for now, here's an example of a phonautogram auto-corrected by my software on the basis of a tuning fork pilot tone. This is an alternate recording of Eau Claire de la Lune, which Scott made on April 17th, 1860, just eight days after the more famous recording of April 9th. Picture Chymophone is well suited to playing not just Scott phonautograms, but any audio waveforms scratched or printed onto paper, including paper prints of early gramophone discs. Uh, people have used it. I, I've heard from one cardiologist, for example, who's been using it to uh, play back printed phonocardiograms, records of heart sounds. Uh, if I haven't said much about the initial capture of the digital data, that's because it's usually just a matter of using an ordinary flatbed scanner to scan images in the ordinary way. However, picture chymophone can also be used to play digital images of mechanical carriers obtained in other ways. For example, it can play the images captured by the well-known Irene 2D system. In October 2017, the Northeast Document Conservation Center, NEDCC, used their Irene 2D setup to create optical stands from a uh, group of broken glass-based lacquer transcription discs, the Mercury Theater's own reference copies of Orson Welles' broadcast of The War of the Worlds, now held by Indiana University's Lilly Library. NEDCC provided us with audio derived from the images using the custom PRISM software that comes bundled with Irene systems, but also with the images themselves. In principle, these images are the preservation master files, the most immediate digital representations of the source with audio files derived secondarily from them. Practically speaking, though, most clients haven't been able to do much with such images beyond preserving them. Uh, the assumption seems to be that they're not of much use, uh, useless without the PRISM software to interpret them. And that software has never been made uh, available for general use outside of facilities with Irene systems. In part, I understand, because the Irene team isn't in a position to offer tech support on the necessary scale. Uh, but these images aren't useless at all. Here's what they look like. There are around uh, 40 images like this per side. The uh, specific set of files I've been exper uh, uh, experimenting with uh, comes from disk one in the series, uh, which has a special problem. A chunk of the disk uh, it's, has shifted out of place, creating big discontinuities, as you see here. At NEDCC, they edited these images before processing to uh, realign the chunk, but I decided to tackle the images as is with no realignment. To track the groove, I generate an, an uh, image downsampled along the time axis to highlight the curvature associated with each rotation of the disk, and then use that as a, a reference to remove the curvature, producing a set of nicely horizontal traces that are easy to convert into sound. For the next step, uh, at first, I tried using the approach I described before to take four different measurements at each point along the groove, um, the whole groove center, the center of each groove wall, and then the, the center of the groove floor, and then average them, which kind of worked. Uh, but just recently, I started uh, trying something else. So here's a diagram of that. So just recently, I started trying something else, um, generating an average groove profile and then finding the best fit between it and each column of the image. That approach turns out to be a lot more robust. How does it sound? Well, I'd like to play you a clip of audio extracted using my software uh, with some declicking and other cleanup done by Dan Figurelli of MDPI. Uh, you will hear some high frequency artifacts, a kind of repetitive musical warble in quiet passages, uh, but those appear to be burned into the images since they were also present in the audio that we got uh, that was furnished by NEDCC. In fact, 
One of my goals in devising an alternative means of playback was to determine uh, whether these were an artifact of scanning or analysis. So here we go, see if you recognize the recording. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the director of the Mercury Theater and star of these broadcasts, Orson Welles. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man, yet as mortal as his own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, they were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. Extracting audio for one disc side takes about an hour, most of which can be unattended. Now, Irene playback of delaminating lacquer discs is an expensive proposition, often prohibitively expensive. And much of the expense lies in the processing into audio rather than the initial scanning. Right now, institutions with tough budgetary decisions to make might be reluctant to pay just to scan high-value disks with Irene before they deteriorate further without going to the extra expense of having the audio extracted by the same vendor at the same time. Even though limiting a project to scanning could conceivably result in getting more endangered content preserved, but the availability of other tools anyone can use to extract audio from these images might change that calculus, uh, as well as fostering a keener critical interest in the specifications of the scans themselves, which would no longer be just for internal use within a single system. Indeed, it's possible to imagine scanning and audio extraction becoming two independent specialties with a symbiotic relationship, more like that between transfer work and restoration work. I still have work to do, but my hope is eventually to release an updated version of Picture Chymophone with all the features I've described, uh, maybe rewritten in Python, and ideally with a modular design so that it's easy to plug in improved or experimental algorithms at will. Thank you for your kind attention. disruptive technology, which on the other hand has probably just generated a lot more uh, a lot more work for NEDCC. Nick Berg received his MA and MA in ethnomusicology from UCLA, where he specialized in the history of recording technology and sound archiving. Perhaps more auspiciously, Nick was mentored by engineers who were pioneered pioneers in optical sound, disc, and magnetic technologies. After several years of digital restoration work, Nick started Endpoint Audio Labs in 2003 so that he could focus on improving the quality of sound transfers before restoration. Today, Endpoint is recognized for its unique transfer technologies and for the deep historical research that informs its transfer decisions. Nick. Thank you for having me. I do uh, 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 the speech impediment, so I was jumbled something up. Uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, today I'm going to talk about um, non-contact, real-time optical playback uh, to complement stylus playback. Uh, and this is the uh, endpoint cylinder machine here. Uh, and it was originally designed for, for stylus playback. Um, and after a year or so of working with uh, improving the optical side of it, you know, it's, it, it, it's easy to forget how 
great. Uh, and how many years went into uh, cartridge and stylus design. So the fidelity of the uh, modern cartridge and stylus is, is pretty incredible. And uh, I mean, uh, this recent project I'm working on now where we're playing back store stock records from the 50s and 60s. And it's, it's always just remarkable what's in those little squiggles and what that little cartridge can do to get them out. Um, and so the, uh, the first priority has always been uh, to do what you can with the stylus and get it right. But there are, uh, you know, of course, instances where the stylus is just not an option. Um, and, and importantly, there's a lot of examples where most of a disc can be played or most of a cylinder with a stylus, so you know, maybe 90% and you're left with this 10%. Um, and so it's, it's a common to kind of have to uh, do that entire thing optically. Uh, but it would be great to kind of you know, seamlessly do the, the best you can with the stylus and then also capture the section that the stylus can't do with, with optical playback. Uh, so that's been the goal. Um, and, and the advantage of real-time optical is just as you would experience with um, uh, disc playback or tape playback, is it's so powerful to be able to adjust what you're doing on the fly, to kind of make tweaks and focus, make tweaks of alignment, you know? I mean, just imagine if you, uh, you couldn't hear azimuth in real time or something <coughs> like that. It's, it's just so challenging to have to like record some options and then try to go back and listen to them and then reset and like that. So, um, so real time has always been, been a goal as well, just so you can do, do these optical adjustments and learn as you're, as you're moving. Um, so there, there are other uses for uh, uh, doing optical playback as well, uh, especially um, as often instances where there's no labels on things. And so maybe you don't want to commit to doing a full archival transfer, you just want to know what's on it. Um, and so it's great to be able to uh, uh, Throw, throw a brown wax cylinder on and hear the content or the introduction, uh, um, things like that, and know w w what's on them. Uh, there's also the option of doing the, the tuning and setup uh, uh, just with the optical and then, and then switch over to stylus afterwards. Uh, and then if there's uh, big cracks and things like that, sometimes you know, the cylinder is not maybe super important, it's not worth the, the risk. Uh, to what will ruin your uh, your stylus potentially, and then of course if there if there is no other option, uh, if there's a big section missing, um, it, it's an option to extract it as uh, as the final audio as well. So the the endpoint cylinder is uh, um, it's it's using the the laser in various ways. Uh, so most importantly, it starts it, it allows you to uh, center the cylinder uh, with. Uh, and with the, um, if there's any kind of run out in the cylinder, it will equal wow. And so the, the first goal is to um, uh, square it up as quickly as possible. So the laser, especially with the, uh, the software now, um, you, you can get into uh, uh, you know, five micron accuracy within you know, 30 seconds, 45 seconds, really quickly. Uh, and so this uh, uh, really helps uh, stylus playback, but it's also important for optical to make sure the, the focus is stable. Um, and so that is, is the, the first application of the laser. Uh, and then the second, um, if there's any kind of eccentricity that you can't get out, uh, it's, it's capturing a, a reference tone uh, uh, to it, a map, essentially, the eccentricity of the cylinder. Uh, the next, it's helping with the, uh, the groove tracking and optical. Um, and then lastly, you're actually hearing the sound as uh, from the output of the laser. Uh, so here's some technical specs. Um, the, uh, the spot uh, is, is kind of like the, uh, the stylus, uh, and so it's adjustable with the, the focus. Uh, the smallest you can get to is about uh, just over a mil, um, and it's slightly elliptical, so that's the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, the short side of it is 1.2 mil. Uh, it has full frequency response. Um, and uh, it has great theoretical resolution, but with all optical systems, especially with uh, uh, wax cylinders and such, the recording level's so low, the modulation's so low, that uh, the actual resolution you know, is half of that, if you're lucky. Um, so, but but uh, the specs are good of the system. Um, so as, as, as a quick example of, uh, let's see if this works.
<laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, the first thing I was doing, it was almost like a novelty. You're like, wow, no hands. You know, it, it'll, it'll play with, without it, you know, because the, the laser was there for other purposes to begin with, and so it was just kind of an add-on bonus. Um, and, I mean, so far as I've been dropping the machines off, uh, everyone, everyone's favorite thing to do is to um, optically DJ scratch a cylinder. Uh, <laughs> so, but... Uh, but, but as it becomes more practical, uh, it's, it's, it's been important to build an interface to really uh, use the properties in the best way possible. So this is the new um, uh, uh, like uh, output user display. Uh, and so this is the same for, for stylus or optical. So you have the option essentially to set it for stylus playback, uh, for optical only playback, or stylus and optical simultaneously. So it'll, uh, it'll uh, capture the optical and uh, the analog at the same time. So it has some important features here to keep an eye on. So you have control over the uh, laser intensity, uh, the angle of the laser, the, the focus of the laser, and it's all being, being recorded. So you, you have it in the metadata. Um, and it'll essentially take a screenshot of this after you're done, so you have a record of exactly how it was set. Um, and then it's also keeping track of uh, how well the, uh, the cylinder is uh, squared up on the mandrel, um, how well the user did the job, as well as how much is left over uh, that have to be corrected afterwards. Uh, and um, uh, cost and availability, it's, it, it's essentially it's an add-on feature to the cylinder machine. So, so it's reasonably uh, you know, priced, $5,900 to do the optical as well as the stylus. Um, and it's, uh, it's currently available in use. Um, the, uh, the goal behind it was really, again, just to, um, uh, to supplement stylus. Uh, so to, uh, uh, to have these, uh, these options to, uh, to play something with, uh, you don't know what it is, or if there's a, um, a crack or something like that to be able to. Uh, so the, the eventual goal is also to help uh, you know, tailor that um, uh, laser audio to get it as close as we can to the, the quality of the stylus so that they can be married if, if you have to have a complete take. Uh, and just real quickly, um, I've also been doing it for um, a lacquer discs as well uh, with, with the laser. Um, so, so again, kind of the idea that uh, they should be done together. So, um, uh, so a turntable that also has a traditional arm and a stylus, uh, get what you can, and then if you still have problems, get just those bad sections uh, optically. Um, it, it's uh, more expensive because uh, two lasers are needed, essentially, to mimic the, um, uh, uh, like a stereo cartridge, essentially, to be able to play the lateral groove. Um, but, uh, you know, even things like a, a, the vintage, um, uh, uh, um, uh, like Technics SP10 turntable, the, uh, the turntable is flat enough to, to um, it's okay for optical. So it can be built into an SP10. Uh, and roughly, you know, it's a lot more expensive because of the extra complexity, but, but depending on the turntable, it's around uh, 20 to 30,000. And uh, thank you. That's it. <laughs> Another disruptive technology, I like it. And I will confess to being one of the first people to scratch optics. <laughs> Tom Levine is a professor of the German department at Princeton University, where he teaches critical theory, sound studies, media theory, and media history. Tom has edited numerous books on the media sociologist and film theorist Siegfried Krakauer. Did I say that correctly? Uh, thank you, Tom. He's also a curator. He's mounted major international exhibitions exploring surveillance and art and the radical French post-war collective known as the Situationists, Situationist International. His current work on optical audio capture grows out of a long-term research project on what he calls the media archaeology of voicemail. Tom?
Thank you, David. Uh, it's humbling to be here as the uh, as more of a, an amateur amongst this extraordinarily erudite group of technically savvy experts. So I hope you'll bear with me. Uh, the Princeton Optical Capture Project <clears throat> grew out of a very pragmatic need, a discovery of a very strange and largely unknown sound recording format the home recorded audio postcard that was introduced in France in 1905 and went out of business for reasons that one can understand within two years. Um, here's such a postcard. Um, if this sounds at all familiar, it is uh, because of the pioneering work on the early history of the gramophonic postcard. Here's the recto of that such a card. Uh, but pioneering work on the early history of the gramophonic postcard by longtime ARSC regular Rainer Lotz, who I saw here this morning, who was one of the first to write in a serious fashion about the sonorine. That's the name of this card, the sonorine. For those of you interested in learning more about this fascinating meta historical curiosity, if you'll allow me an auto plug, um, I'll be presenting a paper on, on this early chapter in what I call, what David just uh, invoked, the media archaeology of voicemail, because this is all about the sending of the voice through the mail, uh, tomorrow morning here at 11 o'clock. For this panel, <clears throat> suffice it to say that I, having come across these cards, I started collecting them until I had amassed an archive of more than 120 individually recorded sonorines. Um, what we're talking about here <coughs> excuse me, are normal postcards. Here you see some of them are city scenes, some of them are people with animals, some of them are artworks from the Louvre, from the Musée de Luxembourg. Um, here's the, the verso of the same card. But on this verso, uh, thank you so much, David, um, they have been coated with a thin veneer of a plaster of Paris-like material into which a spiral vertical cut groove is inscribed. Here you see. I don't know if you can see it, uh, the close-up of the grooves. In French it says, Côté à enregistrer, record this side. As you can imagine, I was enormously curious to hear what was on these cards, but was very concerned about damaging the, the fragile sound carriers. I acquired, to my delight, a completely intact and functioning example of the very rare phonopostal machine the original device on which the cards were both recorded and played back. There are only four, to my knowledge, only four such machines that I know of in North America. That's what it looks like. Uh, mine looks like, just like this one. This is, uh, they have a much better photograph than I did of my own machine. Uh, this is one in the collection of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris. Um, like this one, mine comes with both recording and playback uh, heads and horns. Um, but after examining it up close, uh, you can see here the, the, the postcard is put on this holder that spins and, and you then record and or play back on it. After looking at it uh, closely and studying it, I realized I didn't want to take the chance of damaging the cards by playing them back on the device itself. So the problem is that besides lacking a center hole and being vertically inscribed, the cards also rotate counterclockwise, making playback on a gramophone complicated, even if not impossible, but also potentially risky. And so, in the marvelous way that such things happen at a university, I was talking about this with a computer scientist pal, Adam Finkelstein, and he suggested that we adapt some research he had been doing on what he called fingerprinting paper. We did some calculations. Here's some of the calculations. Um, and then called in another colleague, Simon uh, Ruzinkiewicz, um, also a computer scientist, who could lend us expertise um, from his ongoing project on scanning mosaics. This is Simon and Adam at the whiteboard trying to figure out how could we adapt their various uh, research uh, projects to this particular audio challenge. So here's what we figured out. When you make a scan, the lens is perpendicular to the platen, right? But the light source is at an angle, producing shadow. So if you scan, and we took, uh, 
We tested all kinds of scanners from the cheapest $80 scanner, Canon scanner, to $800 scanners. And we found out hilariously and marvelously that the cheapest $80 scanner was actually the best for our purposes. Uh, so we got a bunch of those scanners. And we then uh, scanned each sonarine card four times. Once in this direction, this direction, this direction, and this direction. If you rotate it 90 degrees after each scan, um, each scan at 1600 DPI, you get this. Um, and since such scans take about five, six minutes uh, a scan, it's good to have a team um, and um, four scanners working simultaneously. There's our team, uh, Angela and Tan. Um, and you can see four laptops, each with a scanner. Each of the scanners has a heavy book to keep the cards flat, um, scanning each of the cards four times. Then once you've got these four scans, and you scan the recto side too, just for reference. Um, if you then aggregate the four scans, uh, which is computationally not trivial, but doable, then you end up with a topography of the card that allows you to calculate the height fields within the grooves. And from there, um, you can compute the sound. This is the, what the height fields look like. Um, you can compute the sound algorithmically. Um, here's one, a different view. Um, and so that's just what we did. Um, and as you'll see in a moment, to our, I have to admit, amazement, it actually worked. Um, that said, many of the recordings were less than ideal, raising the largely undecidable question as to whether the poor signal-to-noise ratio was due to the conditions of the recording device, initial recording device, or the machine itself, or to the less than ideal practices of what were, after all, amateur home recordings, to the potentially multiple playbacks at the time that might have damaged the carrier, or yes, possibly due to the limits of our own optical playback system. So to get a benchmark comparison, at least as regards the last question, how good was our system working, after we finished our capture of the 120 cards that we did in an initial run, we, and this was hilarious, I found out that, that Simon um, is also a pilot and had a plane, so we flew up to Andover, Mass, and brought our cards to NEDCC to have them scanned uh, on the Irene machine. Uh, let's see what they could capture using their technology. Now, the project was interesting to the folks at NEDCC because the combination of vertical inscription on a flat surface required them to mount the head that they normally reserve for cylinder capture, 3D objects, onto that part of the Irene system used for flat uh, disk media. And it was of great interest to us in that having their audio captures gave us a strong sense you'll be able to judge for yourself in a moment uh, that our method was actually working well, or at least good enough. And then, just to give us even more comparative data, we accepted David Giovannoni's generous offer to try to do a gramophonic capture of a few cards in his lab. In fact, he and Patrick Feaster had already done a test on another card a few years earlier to confirm that this was possible. Here's, oh, here are the, here are the, the images of the sonorines on the Irene. Uh, machine and their output screen. Uh, and then here's David's uh, setup. Um, David made transfers at 33 uh, RPM to maximize, as you put it, the quality of tracking and reduce the ballistics that would have occurred at full speed using a 7.5 mil full conical radius stylus in a V15 VX cartridge. This backwards recording, because remember, it's, it's counterclockwise inscription, was then flipped on the temporal axis in software. What you'll hear in a moment are MP3s of the sonorines rendered at 100 RPM with EQ and a little denoising. So let's do some comparative listening. First, you'll hear, this is the, the front of the card, card 41. Uh, this is <laughs> So what he's saying is, uh, in a few days, I'll send you uh, the. To, I'll send you 
Henri, the repair diaphragm. I found everyone here in good health, your parent and friend, Louis. Now, let's listen to the same card captured on Irene. And finally, on David's. So that's one example. I'll give, let's quickly look at another, uh, or list, rather listen to another. Uh, here's the recto. This is our capture. Here's where things stand with our project now. At the present, the system for aggregating the scans, calculating the height fields, inducing the audio is still rather labor intensive. We're currently working to automate as much of it as possible with the idea of making it accessible uh, and in an in easy user-friendly interface to anybody who wants to use it. But the good news is that because I can travel with a small portable scanner, it has already now allowed me to go to various archives who would never lend or risk playing their recorded sonorines and scan them on site in order to then provide the archive, who's allowing me to do this, with the induced sound of their audio postcards. So here's my setup in an archive in Indianapolis. Here's another, my setup in the Phono Museum in Paris near Pigalle. And most amazingly, last weekend, I was at the Bibliothèque Nationale in, in Paris, where after eight months of negotiation and a four-page single-space legal document that I had to sign, um, I was finally able to get them to allow me to scan uh, their seven really beautiful, here's one of them, uh, sonorine cards, um, which I can't wait to hear what's on them. So, Hopefully, we'll soon have the system ready for general, general use, at which point we then plan to explore the possibilities for adapting it also for lateral inscription. And one further wrinkle. With the increasingly high resolution of today's 3D printers, we're also exploring the possibility of using our topographic maps of the audio postcards generated through the scans to then print copies of the sonorines, which we would then play on the original device. Stay tuned. Thank you.
I know what you're talking about in terms of negotiating access to something. <laughs> yeah, I bet you in, in 2008, I walked into the French Academy of Sciences uh, with a well, very large scanner, not under my arm, but on a, on a roller board, and uh, uh, did what Tom is doing, essentially, but to the phonograms. And uh, they had no idea what they had. And, um, uh, but just imagine now being able to go in with a very small scanner anywhere and getting a, getting a playable image of a, of a group medium. I mean, that, again, is another disruptive technology. Stefano, Stefano Sergio Cavalieri is the Chief Technology and Information Officer at the Swiss, Swiss National Sound Archives, a department of the Swiss National Library in Lugano, Switzerland. His audio engineering career culminated in a series of world-class recordings and events in the 1980s. And then 30 years ago, he entered the field of computer science, you know, networking, systems management, software design, digital storage, all those sorts of things. He's earned degrees in both computer science and electroacoustics. Stefano is recognized as a preeminent technical authority in the archival community. He's a recipient of the James A. Lindner Prize for his research in the field of recorded sound preservation. He serves on the technical committees of AES, ARSC, and IASA. Stefano? Thank you, David. <coughs> the system I'm going to present today is not really new. Um, I guess that somebody uh, among you is uh, quite familiar with, with this thing that's been around for about 20 years now, <clears throat> from the very beginning of the, of the project. Um, so this is a very um, easy to read uh, schematics of how the system works. So wh wh what are we doing? Uh, we are actually uh, taking picture of disks um, and then uh, by taking picture of disks I mean taking analog pictures of, of disks and then we scan the pictures and uh, we finally uh, reconstruct uh, the audio from the image. So um, maybe the first question which is always asked is why do we have this intermediate step of uh, taking an analog picture? The analog picture is, uh, is actually this one. Um, so according to our uh, investigations, you know, the, the, the photo is uh, quite accurate uh, in terms of a uh, high resolution copy um, and it's a quick um, and reliable way to freeze the degradation of the surface of the disk. Um, we can compensate um, with, with the depth of field, uh, uh, we can compensate some incoherences on the surface of the disk as well. And the film itself is uh, still small, quite cheap, and very stable as, a, as an archival medium. Um, so this is the camera, uh, actually the third generation photo camera that we've been developing. Um, which allows us to take the pictures which are um, the same size as the original uh, records. So uh, the film we are using, again, this is the, this is the real one, is um, sold on sheets of uh, 35 by 45 centimeters. The second part of the system, or maybe the most important part of the system, is the scanner. It's a kind of a turntable scanner, 
So uh, what I mean by that is that we, we we put the picture on the on the scanner, and the picture rotates, and we read it uh, as more more or less as a turntable uh, does. System throughput is um, quite usable. I mean, to take the picture, you know, the photography, which is the first step, uh, takes more or less 10 minutes uh, from this positioning through to film development. Uh, the scanning of the film takes more or less 30 minutes. Um, and the image processing and image to sound translation may take two and a half hours, but it depends very much on the on the shape of the of the uh, surface of the groove. Of course, these uh, different steps can be uh, uh, processed in different places simultaneously, so you you, you don't need to have a, a an engineer that goes through the three processes uh, uh, all alone. Um, the, uh, the system is based on a, on a very uh, simple uh, uh, principle, which is 2D imaging, which is very close to what Irene 2D does. <clears throat> you can see there the technology is very straightforward. Um, we take a, a, a picture and this picture, which is uh, on a certain point digitized, is subdivided in pixels and each pixel has uh, some coordinates that tell you about the amplitude uh, related to time of what is uh, read on the, on the picture, uh, in this case the roof. <clears throat> Now, um, if we go to some figures uh, and try to translate uh, what the imaging requirements are for producing a, a true, in this case, 16-bit uh, at 44.1 kilohertz uh, resolution, um, uh, image resolution, um, on a coarse groove record, where we can assume that the maximum groove excursion is of 75 microns at taken at 100 millimeters from the center uh, and a rotation speed of 78 RPM, um, we should take into account that uh, for measuring the amplitude, the smallest the, the the bit actually the one each bit should be 1.14 nanometer big or small <clears throat> um, in the other direction I mean in the in the time direction one sample uh, requires uh, 18.5 microns so which is much easy easier to uh, achieve uh, if we do the same calculation on a microgroove record, of course we have smaller uh, figures. Now, if we try to imagine, and, and this is just for the sake of, of making calculations, uh, if we try to imagine um, to get a true 24-bit 96 kilohertz uh, resolution, um, we, sh we actually should shrink the, the pixels or the bits um, to um, 4.47 picometers, which is very, very small. Um, for a coarse groove record and even smaller for a micro groove record. <clears throat> Now, if we look at the system specs of our system, uh, we have to um, start from the actual uh, material that we are using, which is the film itself. 
which is, um, as you can see, a mid-size, uh, still produced Aqua Alliance uh, CE film, which has a silver halide crystal granularity of 0 0.2 microns, uh, and some dye clouds of 10 microns, and so on. Uh, when we scan the film, uh, we are currently using uh, a line sensor with uh, 2048 pixels of uh, 10 microns square size each. But we use some optics to magnify the image, otherwise we wouldn't be capable to take uh, uh, as much information as, as we need. Uh, we do some coarse age detection uh, because we are capable to uh, uh, recognize the uh, inner part and the other part of, of the groove, on both sides of the groove. Um, so by the end, uh, what, it, what we achieve is something like, I mean, the resolution we achieve is something like uh, uh, 0 0.25 microns on the image, on the surface, <clears throat> which is, if I compare that to the specifications of Irene 2D, is more or less the same. Um, in the time direction, no problems. Uh, to try to um, put this on, on, on screen, um, I took an extract of an, of an image, of, a, of an actual image, that shows uh, a groove width of 83 pixels multiplied by 2.5 microns gives us 207.5 microns. Uh, which is which means it is a groove that calls for a 2.3 mils stylus, which is a very common size. Um, on the amplitude, uh, this is an image taken uh, when trying to uh, reproduce a the AES calibration record at one kilohertz. Uh, zero dB reference level and uh, everything else that you see uh, on the screen. Um, imaging, imaging as we do it has constraints. Um, so the sampling by itself does not represent an issue. You know, the, 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 the capture speed can be changed if needed. So. Um, we can adjust it in order to have at least one pixel per audio sample. Um, the, the, the point is that the capture can only happen uh, at the edges or at the bottom of the groove, or combined, which is good because we have, uh, in a, on a coarse groove record, we have usually uh, four places where we can measure where we are. What the real issue is, is quantization. You know, we have lack of information, um, which leads to processing limitation, uh, such as very common uh, things like equalization, de-emphasis, and restoration. <clears throat> and why that? Because what we measure with with this kind of systems is the amplitude and not the velocity, which is what a magnetic photo cartridge does. So how bad is that? Um, we have some black figures and some red figures on screen. Um, this is all for a, a full scale groove displacement at around 70 hertz, 1 kilohertz, 10 kilohertz. What I'm saying with this, within this slide is that in the best case, what we achieve uh, on, the, on the whole frequency uh, spectrum is something between 6 and 9 bit of uh, resolution. Um, 
and it's written in red because this is theory. This is not re not not what happens um, in the everyday use of the system. If you look at the black figures, we are talking about something between three bit and five bit. Um, if we look at the same figures on a micro groove record, of course it gets worse because the imaging system is has the same size. You know, the pixels on the picture are of the same size, but the groove is smaller. Now, um, <clears throat> in order to have, in terms of audio quality, a usable system, a usable um, imaging system that uses the technology we use and Irene 2D uh, uh, uses. Um, we should have pixels at least um, 219 times smaller than we have. But this is only to achieve 16 bit not more than that. Yeah. If we talk about microgroove records, of course, pixels should be smaller. Now, this is probably the slide I, I like uh, uh, the best. Um, if you look at the last sentence on the bottom of the, of the slide, you, you uh, can understand why. If we would try to um, get a true 24-bit resolution, as we know it, um, on a coarse groove record, we should have pixels, you know, 56,000 times smaller than what we have. However, um, as I say in the slide, the figures that we are talking about do not make sense, because we are talking of uh, uh, sizes that are much smaller than a molecule, that are much smaller than the distance between two atoms within a molecule of water. So, all right, um, there are still some benefits uh, of imaging, which is one thing is uh, of course, the picture, the picture is shot without interfering with the surface of the disk, so it, we, we, we do not touch, physically touch the disk. Uh, we can image all kind of disks in all conditions, you know, delaminated, broken, deformed. Um, each size of disk can be read using the same equipment, and, uh, well, image processing is quite, quite well established, so you know, making corrections to the physical inquiries of the disk uh, on the image is not that uh, difficult. I've got two samples here, just a couple of samples here. Uh, one is um, a replay with a turntable and the other one is the same record uh, replayed with visual audio. As you may um, guess, the first sample was uh, uh, the replay with the turntable, and the second one was with uh, with the visual audio system. Um, the 
sound quality is different. We have much uh, higher uh, noise uh, level uh, on the on the imaging system. Uh, we try to apply the same uh, the emphasis curve. Uh, I mean, not the same, but the same calculated and, and compensated because the two systems uh, read different uh, information. Oh, well, this is it. Thank you very much for listening. What strikes me here is that there's similarities between two of these presentations. And then Patrick made the point that um, you could use the Irene platform to preserve a lot of stuff and get the preservation copy, which is an image, not an audio file, but an image, relatively quickly. Um, that, this, can I hold this up, Stefan? Oh, yes. I mean, this image might have been taken 20 years ago, and I guarantee you this lacquer's not gotten any better. So if you could take a lot of photos of them really quickly, there again, you've got an accelerated preservation program. You can deal with uh, playback and access later. But that strikes me as two of these things. Please forgive my French pronunciation on the following. But Jean-Yves Chignot earned his degree from École Polytechnique and École Nationale Supérieure de Telecommunications. I should have translated that into English, but that's beyond me. But upon graduation, he joined INA, where he developed software for 3D modeling and participated in the Virtual Studios Synthetic TV project. He now manages INA's video processing and restoration research team. He's also been involved in a number of European research projects related to audio and video presentation, digitization, restoration, large-scale fingerprinting, and content tracking. He's the project manager of the Saphir Optical Playback Project, which we're going to hear about next. Thank you, David. Thank you for all of us to be here. Uh, so, as mentioned, I will present to you the Saphir uh, optical scanner for audio, uh, analog audio recordings. So, um, yes, uh, for some, some of you may remember the Bushman Mayer method. That was not a method for reading a, a disk, but for evaluating the uh, uh, recording level on these disks. And if you look at the there, yeah, there, yeah. the width of the uh, light bandwidth uh, accurately measures the level at which the signal is recorded. If you see these uh, nice patterns here, it's because it's uh, uh, the reference uh, disks with uh, uh, different numbers of uh, 1,000 hertz uh, recordings. Um, and there is also a, a sweep, etc. cetera. A very nice discs uh, that uh, um, uh, David mentioned also. So uh, taking upon this idea of using the reflection of light on the groove walls, we've designed the uh, Saphir system there. And we cast a number of rays onto the groove wall and see what comes up to the camera and the uh, uh, color, uh, because we've, we use um, a colored mask, the color that comes back to the camera gives us directly a reading of the velocity that we get on the picture. And if we keep only the uh, hue, the, um, uh, the color on the picture, we actually can translate that onto uh, an audio uh, signal track. And it's uh, relatively straightforward. You, uh, you put the light, you cast your rays, you uh, get the pictures, and you uh, get the, uh, the color, and then, then get the audio signal. So um, we've got a, a, a relatively compact optical scanning head. It's that size. And uh, same principle, but physically, uh, uh, we fold the uh, light path in a number of times. It goes through this this. 
uh, colored masks, uh, gets to a small area of the disk, and then gets back, back to the camera, which makes the pictures that we uh, process. So, um, yeah, we've uh, been able to uh, uh, make in uh, last December the new uh, uh, scanner, uh, the new Sapphire scanner, and it's uh, much faster than the older uh, scanner that we, ha that we had. We used to uh, be able to scan a standard uh, disk in uh, three hours. Now it comes down to 30 minutes, which we uh, do agree is not real time. But still, it helps very much. And it's much more transportable. Uh, we've uh, recently been able to uh, move it to a new location, uh, scan a number of disks, and move it back in one day. And um, that's uh, quite an improvement for us. And so, and uh, after scanning, of course, you've got to use a, a decoding software with a graphical user interface to get the signals out of the pictures. Yeah, there. So, okay, yeah. okay, this way. Um, so uh, basically what we have to, if I come back to the, yeah, we've got the tracks. From the pictures we get the tracks. And if you've got, uh, as uh, here, a broken disk, it's a glass-based uh, recording, uh, then the, at some point the tracks end and a new track st starts. And then you're, you're uh, um, with uh, the problem of knowing how to reconstruct the correct path within the complete disk. And uh, the approach we've used is trying to figure out a number of possible connections for each piece of uh, track. Uh, it, the number can be quite high sometimes. It depends on the parameters. But uh, the nice thing is that we don't have to reconnect manually. Uh, we transform that into a, a problem that the computer can solve for us. Solve for us and tell us, OK, the right connections are these ones. And if at some point uh, the, the solution is not the right one, uh, you arrive to something like that. And suddenly you realize that the blue line here, you didn't pass through the, this blue line. And it found another way of getting uh, all the connections. But that's not the right solution. So um, sometimes we have to help. And we uh, design these green boxes here uh, to tell the computer that uh, what the right connections are. And it helps very much. And um, in most cases, uh, even in the most difficult cases, we are able to uh, uh, reconstruct the correct path um, with a signal quality that varies, we will see. Uh, for example, the good example. Mamma, son tanto felice, per chi ritorna da te, questa canzone mi dice, che il più bella sogno è per te. Uh, you may notice that uh, there, are, there is a level of high frequencies in there because the, our system allows, it's a velocity reading system, so it has its drawbacks, but at least the high frequencies we, we can get right uh, usually. Uh, a, a much more difficult one. Nous verrions l'éclosion de l'école existentialiste populiste. Je suis capable de toucher. C'est ça, c'est ça, on finit. C'est fini. Bravo. Allez, bravo. 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 Ne cachez pas la fini. Uh, this set of disks is uh, interesting because it's uh, the recording, the live recording, uh, on site uh, in uh, Montmartre in Paris of uh, an épée duel between two French painters. And one had invented a pictorial existentialism, 
uh, as a follow-up to uh, Sartre's uh, existentialism. And another uh, painter, uh, René Gaillard, was uh, firmly against it, and they, um, they exchanged his insults and then decided to uh, uh, meet and to have this duel. And, um, and it was recorded by a, a TV pioneer, uh, a French TV pioneer, uh, Pierre Sabag, very famous in, in France. And so it's, uh, it was really um, uh, something that we, uh, we are very proud of being able to, uh, to, to get. Uh, the, the lacquer here uh, was peeling off because it was a zinc-based lacquer. Um, two zinc-based lacquers, uh, side one and three and side two. And uh, we didn't get everything out of these discs, but uh, we've been able to reconstruct the correct path on all the pieces that were uh, left. And the signal, OK, the signal is bad, but uh, it's not that, that bad. Uh, a, a worse one would be that one. Did you hear anything? Yes. No, no. no. Okay. Uh, m maybe next time. Uh, I'm, I, I, I will improve on that, but uh, the problem here is not the cracks, which are not that difficult for us, but the, uh, the exudates. Uh, so you've got palmitic acid coming out of the of the disc, and this one you probably don't want to use ultrasonic cleaner. Uh, so. For the moment, uh, we are a bit, a bit stuck here. Uh, the the uh, amount of, uh, <laughs> of exudates is very high. And uh, OK, maybe we will be able to get something out of this uh, disk later. But it will be very, very, very bad anyway. Um, let's try that. So the thumbs here are uh, based on the fact that the lacquer uh, curves in. And even if we can put a glass, uh, we most of the time put a glass plate onto the disc to flatten the, di the, the lacquer flakes, uh, there is still some uh, easing. And it makes uh, a change in the signal that uh, comes to a sorry, uh, high and low. And it makes these thumbs. But still, uh, on a clear. Uh, disc, we are, uh, we, are, we are quite happy to discover that our system was able to, uh, using color uh, reading, discolored discs. So it was um, uh, a discovery. Um, I think I've got. Uh, <laughs> So you've got a number of cracks because it, this side was cancelled, but uh, we could still be able to uh, to, reco to uh, recover it. Um, so um, yeah, uh, the quality. We've got uh, the nice point is that we can get the highest frequencies uh, up to 20, uh, more than 20 kilohertz in 78, not that much in uh, 33, and with a decent signal to noise ratio, uh, even at high frequencies. Um, even there, uh, the quality is usually not as good as stylus, uh, as a good stylus playback, uh, because of surface noise, because of exudates. And the worse the exudates are, the uh, worse the quality uh, drops. Uh, we've got also problems with uh, parax. The, the fact that we've got a, a compact head makes uh, it uh, a bit difficult to uh, get the exact value of the signal. So sometimes we, we get uh, some additional noise. We may uh, eventually make a slightly larger head, which would, should improve that. But we uh, sometimes got, come to nice surprises uh, with the disc with the, that have wide tracks. The wider the track, uh, the better the signal. We, um, uh, as we are casting light onto the groove wall, 
uh, as much light uh, that comes onto the groove wall gets us some indication on what the signal is. Uh, it, the highly delimited sites may be read even sometimes with a loud and clear signal despite of the cracks and the pops that inevitably come in. So uh, sometimes uh, a bit of post-processing is necessary. Um, we Even uh, big missing chunks can be interpolated provided that it's only a fraction of a second. Uh, above a fraction of a second, it's better to keep uh, it silent because uh, we are not reinventing words, but uh, uh, parts of words sometimes can be reinterpolated without uh, too, much, uh, uh, too much intervention. So um, it's not real time, of course. Uh, something like five minutes for setting up the uh, scanning, uh, 30 minutes for scanning on average. Uh, the initial recording, where you get all the tracks out of the pictures, it's something like one hour. If the disk is very difficult, it can be uh, more than one hour. Uh, it can be sometimes overnight, but uh, on, it depends on the disk condition. And it can be parallelized. You can have several decoding uh, working uh, at once. And the reconnections uh, of the uh, different pieces, uh, it can be quite straightforward, a few seconds, if, if the disk is clean or if the uh, cracks are wide and clear. Uh, if you've got many, 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 many cracks, then it can become much, much longer and involve both the computer power and the user. So, um, yeah. Um, uh, okay, Safil is searched for uh, only disk records. We've not uh, made uh, uh, attempts at uh, cylinders or tapes or whatever. Uh, of, of course, it's uh, disk records. It can play shellacs uh, as well as lacquers. It can play broken disks, uh, blo broken uh, glass-based lacquers. Any speed, the speed is not a problem. Actually, the signal improves with uh, 33 uh, RPMs disks because we uh, read velocity and so the angles are higher and uh, we get a slightly better quality at 33. Uh, delaminated broken, cracked, transparent, discolored, colored, oxidized. Uh, oxidized uh, zinc based uh, usually results in very poor quality with a lot of clicks and pops and uh, it causes problem to the software as well. So uh, there is some improvement that we expect to, uh, to get to make it faster. Uh, Exudate is the, the, the worst. Uh, uh, it can play vinyls, uh, coarse or micro groove. It can, we've tested it on uh, flexible records, it works, and, uh, but it's only capture one side of one uh, groove wall, so it's uh, only mono. Uh, we can also uh, work on a vertical, uh, vertical groove. Uh, it's not, the quality is not very high, but it's possible. And we've worked on stampers. Uh, it can play whatever directions, whatever direction. And uh, we've started working on some printed postcards uh, with, where the grooves are on the printed side. Uh, which adds a lot of noise, and uh, for the moment we uh, we didn't get a signal out of the of, of the postcards, but uh, we are we may get something. Um, okay, uh, availability uh, for the moment we only got two prototypes, and uh, one is really a bench prototype, and the second one is the one that you can see in the top corner. Uh, but the intention is that we make. Uh, as many uh, such machines as possible. For the moment, the bill of materials of the uh, equipment is something is largely under uh, 5,000 euros. So uh, it could not be a very, very high-end system. So we expect to be able to make uh, an, a number of these. Uh, when uh, when building the system, some tuning is of course required, uh, and um, so it's not uh, immediately straightforward. And we expect, uh, we don't expect to make money with this system, so uh, we'll probably try rather to give away uh, the software. Um, maybe not the hardware, but at least the software. And uh, the objective is to be able to train an end user, at least in INA, uh, by the end of the year, uh, of this year. 
Yeah. Uh, if you want to get more on Sapphire, we've got a, uh, in today's uh, session uh, on lacquers at four in the same room. Uh, I will have a, a longer uh, presentation with uh, more examples. Uh, so, so, someone uh, that uh, will be very interesting uh, as well. So I hope you will be here. There is a website, and uh, we intend to be able to uh, during uh, IASA 2019 to bring the system to Amsterdam, to Hilversum, and if you can, uh, uh, if you can uh, bring your records, because we'll uh, try to scan them for free and, uh, and decode them as well. So uh, uh, it, it should be quite an experience. Uh, maybe it won't work. Uh, I hope it will, but uh, maybe. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you for your attention. I'm amazed. I mean, they've, they've, uh, these, each of these gentlemen has taken a very complex technology and distilled it into something that even I could understand in 15 minutes. And uh, for that, they deserve another round of applause, I think. That's it. Thank you very much.